I think that just as we're living in a nuclear age, we have grown so tremendously in scientific knowledge, it doesn't seem uh, too much to say that men can begin to awaken to the fact that they have, haven't grown enough spiritually and haven't recognized their spiritual capacities. Once something like eating is death, then you've struck at the very heart of life. The enemy of the older radical theories may have been the ruling class, but today the stakes of whether we will reform ourselves into a new kind of human being, a new kind of society, whether we will find selves worth being, the stakes of it are simply life itself. Modernity has created promises that it has no ability to keep. What this means is that we're a society of disembedded individuals, um, stuck in the impossible situation of being alone together. And what was understood as emancipation has proved to be a form of isolation. It is important to understand that what I am telling you is not simply a cultural history. It's a description of the story that shapes every single person that you know. This is why there is a rise in mental illness. It's absolutely concurrent with the disembedding of the individual because individuals can't constitute themselves by the very nature of the case. Subjectivity cannot sustain its own weight. We need others to tell us. But we've been given an ethical mandate by the Enlightenment that tells us that that's immoral, that nobody should constrain us. Okay, so we're back for the episode two of the, of the Mort Collective Postmortem. Uh, we left off about halfway through at the end of 2020, but just to briefly recap how that year went, uh, the lot of the three guys that started it with me uh, in June, the last, the, the second person left. Um, around that same time, Emily started volunteering. Um, we realized we we skipped over her. So, how would you describe you, what you're about, why you joined up, etc. Okay. Um... Well, I was coming, I was just about to graduate in 2020 um, here in Kansas City. Um, and that's whenever peak, everything was like shut down. Everyone was in, I guess we called COVID lockdown and everything. Um, and I was on the cusp of graduating and was like looking for what to do because I just got let go from a really cool nonprofit gig that also intersected a lot with what I wanted to do with environmental work and also working with people. Um, but also working for a nonprofit has its problems and a grant didn't come through, so I got let go. So I was kind of looking for, um, I don't know, something, honestly, something new, something that I thought would still be fulfilling with people and with the environment somehow. Um, because real quick, part of it, you were involved with Sunrise. What do you call yourself? I wasn't. Yeah. At the time, I wasn't, though. I was like, I think during COVID, everything fizzled out there. But yeah, I was formally like really involved with this climate justice organization called Sunrise Movement, which is basically like a very, I don't know, Spencer would probably use the term like left liberal young adult um like youth activist climate movement so they were working with like trying to push policy and other sorts of things um and get their community organized to start to make some efforts towards um the climate change crisis and everything but i was involved in that for pretty much my entire college career here in kansas city and then once covid happened i don't know it kind of it slipped through i started not going anymore and the hub itself is what we called ourselves disbanded to a certain degree. It's back up in action now, but I don't, I'm not involved anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, I was still, I was also very like dissatisfied with the work we were doing there in the sense of, I didn't feel like we were actually trying to live out what we were saying. We were more so just like trying to plan protests and yell at our politicians. And that just didn't seem very one fulfilling. And also like we were really getting anywhere. Um, we were spending all this time like working on like how we're we going to go to this politician's office, but not time talking about like, how are we actually going to like change our lives and the people's lives around us? Um, so over that course of time, I got very dissatisfied and it came a lot with um, a lot of like identity politics too was a big part of it that 
kind of drove me crazy. Um, so yeah, I left for many reasons. But anyways, around that time, uh, one of my good friends and I were looking to move into an apartment together. Um, and we happened to meet Mary, his aunt, who was our landlord, who was mentioned, who interviewed in the last episode. Um, but yeah, I was looking for something. I had mentioned that I was about to graduate um, and really interested in like urban farming potentially, or just like other agriculture activities. And she was like, well, my nephew happens to do that in Kansas City. Um, and so she got us a tour with him and the other guy at the time uh, to kind of just like see this nonprofit that they were working at and everything. And they had mentioned that they just got this land here. Um, and I was a very eager, excited um, post-grad, just looking for something to do. Um, and I was like, I'm totally here to help. You don't have to pay me. I just want to volunteer and learn. Um, and yeah, that's kind of where I got started. I was here. I was probably, I started with like two days a week and then slowly but surely over the course of 2020, anytime I wasn't working my normal job, which was just like a barista, I wasn't doing anything exciting, but uh, I would be here helping. So, yeah. Although just briefly in that barista job, you were at a an outfit that what purports to sell like local goods and be about building up the oh, local yeah. economy and yeah. so wasn't that kind of disillusioning that was also very disillusioning in the sense of this it was this um company that like its whole mission is to support local and that by supporting all these local um businesses and vendors and whatever that were like keeping all this money in kansas city rather than which is true i like i think that's true but they also have this they're local, but they're growing as a any chain would, really, which I think was it was a problem for me in the sense of like we're really just becoming like, I don't know, just another corporation essentially. But we have this mission to support small, but yet we're gonna grow as big as we can because we don't want to let any other vendor take up this, I don't know, important lease space in Kansas City. I remember there was a time whenever uh a Starbucks was going out of business in Kansas City. And if people don't know anything about Kansas City, Kansas City has loads of coffee shops. A coffee shop probably within every like half mile, basically, you can find coffee. Um, so the market is very saturated. And there was a time in downtown Kansas City where Starbucks was closed. And made in case or this business was about to <laughs> um fight another like small um coffee roaster for this space just so they could have this space and sell their coffee rather than another local vendor having their coffee which in my mind is like a contradiction of values of i thought you said you wanted to like support these small businesses but yeah you're like fighting to get your spot in line that way this other small business can't take this real estate so mm. and there's instances of like all of those things too, but it grew to be, and small things that I was trying to initiate in the business, like composting coffee grinds. Um, it also grew harder because we kept expanding and expanding. And so I was like driving around to all these locations within like 15 to 20 miles away from each other, trying to pick up coffee grinds. And I don't know, the company didn't want to support it. So I don't know. It, it's hard to do as a one woman show. <laughs> Yeah. Which this is a company that would like you to think they are the type of people that yes. would support compost. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. That was They're, pretty good education, I'd say. Like, yeah. that sounds like, yeah, you learn so much from that experience. It's, yeah. it's disillusioning, but but yeah, like, that's very and, quickly learn quite a bit. Yeah. And, and part of it, like that summer and fall, you know, like, we did like while we were working we did tons of talking about like well these are the contradictions of capitalism yeah um this is what happens if you don't take seriously like living out christian virtues mm -hmm. and then you combine those two things and then it's like i don't remember exactly when it happened but for a little while there was talk about would they open up since they since they're really about selling local goods mm -hmm. and then they branched out to coffee and they they had alcohol too right yes like, oh yeah mm -hmm. uh there was a time when they were like, at least they were toying with the idea of, do we start selling like produce? Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. like local vegetables and fruits and stuff. And then very quickly, their action said, no, but we're going to open like Hawaiian loo. Oh, yeah. That was also horrible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which, which is to, to connect where this is relevant, not just like a critique of the kind of like uh, the local small is beautiful front porch republic type stuff. It's, it sounds nice, but then what do you do when when you want to scale up and everybody's always going to want to scale up and it will be reasonable and rational for them to want to do so. Um, the, there's limits to that kind of worldview. Because I mean, if to, uh, I hope I'm not speaking on a turn, but like, mm-hmm. isn't it partly because if they don't do that, they will go out of business in the current environment, right? Like if you're not trying to gain territory, somebody else is and mm-hmm. therefore you know, you, you risk going out of business. So it's, yes, it's probably the desire to make ever more money, but it's also a survival instinct. Like that's the game that you have to play. And that pretty much destroys the original intentions right? or good. Right. And where, where you'll get more like petty bourgeois or like libertarian politics, uh, wh- why from like a Marxist perspective, it's, it's considered like utopian socialism. Is there not wrong that in theory, if everybody just accepted limits, uh, gave up on like the, the drive for further acquisition and growth, you know, could we have small scale, you know, could we have a front porch Republic? I suppose in theory, but will capital allow that to happen? You know, what would happen to real estate investment? Um, Mm -hmm. if we all just decided to live in a mom and pop local utopia, everybody would have to make that agreement simultaneously or it wouldn't work too, because there's always somebody out there that's going to want to take over and do a whole lot more than that. So you'd have to have it done by law is what I think. Right. Mm -hmm. And we just kind of like wrote out the year production wise because the other guy left at like really not a good time. Like right when summer growing really begins, Mm -hmm. but we, you know, wrote it out, made it work. Uh, you know, did a lot of talking about things. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, like we said, 2021 kind of started with a bang because it's like the nonprofit we worked for uh, got associated with like the January 6th stuff. Um, I took like a week off just kind of like meditating on like how much, how much did I really care? Like to what extent was I sort of condoning or enabling, uh, you know, malevolent politics. Um, At the end of it, I decided I mostly didn't care. Like, I don't approve of any of it, really. But, like, I think there's a lot of left liberal hysteria about, like, oh, they were going to, like, overthrow the democracy and this would be the rise of white nationalist fascism. And and clearly they're not up for that. Um. Yeah, I don't think there's that many hardcore people to get that accomplished. So, um, but, but, you know, suffice it to say, it was kind of like a, it came as a surprise to me. And it seemed like it came as a surprise to you that, um, that, that kind of those views kind of popped out in public. Yeah. 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 Well, and where I was less, I mean, we've been talking about this for years that, that, that kind of Jeffersonian, Jacksonian, I guess call it fascism if you want. I don't necessarily object. That is just part of the American character, I think. Sure, Um, sure. It's just vulgarized in the current context a bit more than most people can stomach, but otherwise there's a lot of common themes there for sure. Sure. Um, And it's a very old story along with the kind of like millenarian apocalyptic politics that final, you know, if we can just get the negative elements out of our society and revive the American Republic, then we can truly be the city on the hill, have the front porch, utopian socialism, what have you. Um, So I guess uh, I would argue just being part of an adult politically in this country is accepting that 25 to 50 percent of the population does buy into something like that. And what do you it's just it's just real. Right. And then, and, and I think it doesn't go down well with 
the food scene, right? The the sort of organic and green and food scene folks is where it really, there's a huge clash there, which makes that situation even more problematic. But yeah, like it's the way I look at it is it's kind of like a, a very, I keep using the word vulgar, crude, whatever you want to call it, a crude version of a, of a stream of thought that's been going on a long time. I mean, I knew people like that growing up in the Quad Cities in a big city in Illinois, you know, so yeah. Right. And then, you know, th- there's a type of person, um, I don't know how I got it, but I'm like on the Atlantic's email list. Um, and and that one of their recent things is like extremism on the internet is like uh, corrupting American democracy. That's like their new thing. And like, I think it's just, if somebody talks to you and they're like, QAnon is this, or a few years ago, QAnon is this dangerous thing. You know, it's this new thing. We've got to wrap our heads around it. But like, it's the same uh, it's the same, like whatever you just trace it back to like, uh, just right-wing conspiracy theories, like John Birch society, the anti-Masonic party, like none of this is new. Um, and, um, yeah. yeah. And, and to your point, as it gets increasingly, like it's people telling each other the stuff on the forums and they're increasingly faithless people. It loses any kind of actual religious substance. And anyway, uh had to do some soul searching to to say to what extent can i be complicit with this and i decided if we're really worried about this if you're the 25 to 50 percent of the other half of the country that that's worried about this then the real tragedy is that we haven't organized an actual better society or an actual political agency that could contest the white nationalist neo john Birch society people yeah, um, that haven't um, that we haven't created a situation where far fewer people become attracted to those ideas because there's something better on offer. Right, and to me, that is the real discussion. Not look at these bad people. We need to like listen to podcasts where people with nasally voices complain about them. <laughs> Turn up the volume. I say this. I'm a person with the nasally voice, so I get to talk about my people. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so had some soul searching, uh, about that. Uh, and it's just another example of, I wanted to do a kind of collective lifestyle anarchism. And then what do you do (laughs) when your boss runs off to January 6th, you know, (laughs) you know, and, and to be clear, he was not, as far as I understand, not one of the people that stormed the Capitol. It sounds like there was a wider protest around, uh, the incendiary core of it. Oh yeah. So, um, decided rightly or wrongly, uh, to, to stay involved, uh, had to tell Emily, you know, I had to have a talk with Emily about like, okay, so this boss that you've never even met. That I just started working for yeah. like three weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. And I know you're coming out of sunrise and they're all about how we organize the BIPOCs and the women and the queers, uh, to combat climate change. But this is where our boss was at. Um, which I guess is is funny in a in a kind of ironic, yeah, grim way. Um, and the plan for twenty one was kind of to like replicate what we did production wise in twenty twenty because at least whatever its failings, um, sales were up because the food hub had worked hard to to do that modified CSA model, and I was kind of like cautiously optimistic um, that 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 upward trend could continue and i didn't have any i I was like intellectually bankrupt for the most part like unless we just scrap totally scrap the more market gardening plan i don't know what i could do differently since i'm locked into a series of choices Mm -hmm. um and so the idea was just kind of put it on ice um just get through that that year yeah, yeah yeah the other thing i was coming off of um, I, I've mentioned him in a lot of the podcasts, but Matt Chrisman from the, the good one third of Chapo Trap House. Yeah. Um, he, in the same time that Mort was falling apart, his hopes for like the uh, and and Chapo's hopes for like a Sanders presidency had had gone by the boards, and so he'd started this pot his vlog that he called like he he kept talking about like we just need to take the grill pill, 
or we just need to like calm down, not be hysterical, accept that we've lost account for where we go from here, but there's nothing to be done. Like it doesn't matter who you vote for. Uh, you know, if we want a more radical change, we cannot have it in the short run. And so let's just calm down and chill out and assess, sit tight and assess. Right. So, so part of the idea and partly inspired by that uh, or reaffirmed by that was, OK, 21 is like the grill pill. Let's just do it again and see where where we're at. Um, and one of the most demoralizing things was we, we tried to replicate the seedling sale that we did. Uh-huh. And like it was bad, like not only did we not have sales, which that in and of itself is like normal, but. The real bummer was various of my family members who would garden. And then one of her best friends who started gardening just like didn't buy anything either. That's just rough. I do remember that. And it was just kind of hard to fathom from from my perspective. I, Yeah. But now in the meantime, since that has happened, it's caused me to contemplate more, you know, how my family and friends don't necessarily like support the stuff that I do too. I think it's a fairly common thing, which is not good, but like, yeah. So although at least, yeah, where where our things were worse is like literally the, the, the people we were referring to were literally gardening that year. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. And definitely knew exactly what you were up to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. And, and who's got the expertise, you know, to not only like give you the plants, but tell you which ones will work in what part of your yard and even put them in for you, if you, you know, mm-hmm. anyway. Yeah. Well, and that was one when I, when I lightly got into it with, with one of the people, um, their response was, well, last year, the tomatoes you gave me didn't turn out to be the tomatoes I wanted. And so, so I took my business elsewhere. Um, and and to me, it was w- where this was a kind of like, it was like a continuation of the failures, of the organizing failures, I would say. But I came to Kansas City wanting to like improve people's lives. And they're like, well, actually, uh, you didn't give me what I wanted. Uh, and I wasn't going to like give you that feedback. Uh, beforehand when you're like playing in your seedling sale and right. yeah that would have been good to know what what they wanted if they wanted something specific then you could have grown that i could have but you know the the deeper tragedy is really i wanted to help people like permaculturalize their lives mm-hmm. you know like if if these people are gardening uh how can we incorporate perennial stuff and if your answer is not only do I not want perennial stuff, I want to grow the same stuff I always grow so much so that I don't even want you to give me new varieties or try different varieties of what I already grow. Right. Then we're back at, to the extent that like our symbol was like the caterpillar and the butterfly. I was like, how do we get in cocoons? How do we become butterflies? And they're like, I'm just a caterpillar and I just want to eat these leaves. Right. So like there's two things going on there from my perspective. One is they're just so conditioned by market thinking that they're even looking at their own like, um, you know, related person (laughs) as a part of that market and therefore sort of instinctually like behave in the same way, regardless of the personal relationship. Um, But also familiarity breeds contempt, you know? So like, I, I can't tell you how many times family members have not taken my very considered advice about fairly important things and then turned around and taken the same exact advice from a stranger or a so-called expert Mm -hmm. that I apparently can't be no matter how much I've, you know, studied up on anything or done, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) because they know me. And then the extra wild thing is I find a certain amount of times they'll come back to you and say, hey, I listened to this guy and he gave me good advice. Yes. Yes. Right. And that's when what it starts to say feel, a year ago. Okay. And that's when it starts to feel like, you know, more personal or something. Or like, yeah. is, is this like, are you Borat? Is this being filmed? Like, it's such an absurd. I know. It's hard not to take it personally. It is. 
And when mm. you come back, which I've done, like, I, I love my dad. He's my beloved dad, right? But like, though he's certainly done this a few times. And I'll come back and say, so how come you took this advice from this guy that you barely know who works for, you know, a gardening store here in town? Um, but I've been saying it for years and you never, you even laughed about it, you know, uh, which was not tilling, you know, um, and he didn't have a good answer for that. He was just like, well, you know, like I, I figured the expert would know, would know more is bo- what it kind of boils down to, mm-hmm. but yeah, like, wow. So <laughs> it's definitely a thing. Yeah. Yeah. And some people would say. Uh, you know, what we're complaining about here, we're overthinking it. We just need to like, just keep going on, uh, you know, get your sales where you can, don't worry, but don't connect dots, you know? Yeah. But f- for me, where it was very hard to not connect dots, it's like, I wanted to be in community with people and even people that like say their family and or in community with us. Uh, yeah. Are like, I'd rather go to Home Depot, even though it's against my professed values. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, it's it's partly because um, it's preferable, at least from the point of view we have, to build personal relationships through your transactions as and your your work. Whereas I think people are so conditioned to like impersonalize those things. And to turn things over to experts that are always anonymous, you know, faceless, remote. And how much are they really experts? Oh, yeah. Like they're not. They're not any more expert than than you or I on many things. Right. Like you are an expert when it comes to growing things, especially in your area, you know. But um, the personal relationship doesn't count for anything because we've been so trained that personal relationships should have nothing to do with our transactions. And then where, I mean, if, if you'll humor a moment of me complaining about not being like seen and heard is like, I've literally tried to like commit my life to doing stuff like this. So it's not just this petty, like, Oh, I lost the sale. Um, It's like, I lost this sale when I was mostly, it was already a stupid decision and I was doing it to like, how, however, like quixotically, I was doing it to try and make a better world. And they're like, eh, I'd rather just go to Home Depot. Mm-hmm. Even though I'm, I'm the type of, I know I'm, I, I'm, I'm rehashing, but these people claim that they're the type of people that would do otherwise. And they claim that they care about you and you like, put a lot of skin in the game and they more or less stab you in the back or turn their back on you at least. Right. And I think from their perspective, if you just ask them straight out, do you want to like diss your relative? You know, like, do you want to like hurt the, their feelings or something like that? They would say, well, God, no, you know, of course, not. you know, I would never do that. So they're just, they're not connecting, you know, and, right. and that's, that's, that's a piece of the puzzle that you have to figure out how to like jolt people into making those connections. And, and the more I think about it, like, and, and I don't mean this in a mean way, but it's, it's almost like a species of autism Mm -hmm. or something like an, an inability to like be social and like connect these dots. I think there's something there because I think, um, yeah, the, the way that we're organized now creates a certain amount of, of that in all of us to the extent that we're not seeing, we're not knowing how to relate at a personal level, and we're not seeing the personal human connections. Our whole economic system obscures the human relations, um, you know, in the process of producing things as well as selling them. So why mm-hmm. wouldn't we be somewhat, sure. you know, autistic Um Right. Although I, my, I, I agree with that, but then I'd add, but they're not even making good impersonal decisions either. Hmm. So, so you're, you're right that they're not handling their interpersonal relationships well, but they're also not even handling their own like liberal, rational self-interest well. Because it's not what they're doing is not in their long-term self-interest or how do you mean? Yeah. Like, so for instance, I would argue one of the reasons uh, when the first guy that left Mort, 
one of the reasons that catering gig didn't work out very well is because certain people would rather would have rather gone to fast food and pay basically the same amount. The only thing they were missing was the convenience, but they were trading a certain amount of convenience for like objectively bad food. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so their long-term self-interest would be in health, in health, basically. Right. Yeah. And they're not willing to do that. And, you know, one of the arguments that's always used in liberal theory or was used back in from the Enlightenment on was that, you know, people would could be trained to think in terms of their long term interest and that actually market thinking would promote that, mm -hmm. you know, because you'd want to stay in it for the long haul. And so you would be willing to put in investments into certain things, you know, and 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 that that would pay off in the long run. But what we're, we've got in the economy and then what also in how we treat our bodies, I suppose now, right, is very short term momentary pleasure, you know, or short-term satisfaction. It hasn't, it just hasn't worked. Long-term self-interest, if we, if we consistently thought that way, we would have a much better world than we do. And, and what I encountered is I tried to build that better world and results at best have been very, very mixed and, and where they objectively haven't worked. It's like worse than I could have imagined because yeah, I yeah. You, you would not think, you know, like one of her best friends who would start gardening wouldn't buy from us or, or forget about us, buy from like another local grower or something. Mm -hmm. Like part of my complaints, I, I want this to be clear. Everything that I'm complaining about, if they were going to other, you know, other more collectives or other local farms, mm -hmm. if, if other farms were winning and we were losing, then I'd be more inclined to say like, well, it's just on us. We're losers. Mm -hmm. But when I look around, even the alleged winners seem like losers to me. Mm -hmm. in, in the long run, in the short run, they're, they're mortgaged by uh, basically their, I, I would say privilege in the broad sense. They're mortgaged by their privilege so they can imagine they're more successful than they're actually being. Um, right. They're specifically, they're choosing, um, you know, corporate purchasing, even, even though they say, and I know we've repeated this endlessly, but this is the real shocker, is even though in your conversations with them, in their sort of memberships and things, uh, you know, what they say on, on the social, social media, um, all would say that they value the environment, health, you know, and local. Mm -hmm. This is this is like the pastiche of virtue, right? Um, and so what you found out is is it's made it's for a lot of people, it's very surface, and that they've confused um surface expression with mm -hmm. actual core values. With, with core values have to be acted on. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Which is all I mean, one of the, the recurring refrains in Chrisman's uh grill pill show was you know, Marx complained about peasants being uh, potatoes in a sack, and now we're Pringles in a tube. Mm -hmm. Like, we're subnatural, we've been processed, we've been vacuum-packed. That's a, f a figurative way to say what we're talking about. Right. To me, I relate to that as just a dullness. There's a dullness and a lack of life in a lot of, a lot of people that makes it very difficult for them to sort of punch their way out of the wet paper bag that is this superficial, you know, stance um, towards some sort of like effort at consistency. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're facing all of that. Both of you have kind of come to terms with that to a certain extent. So bad experiences but like what do you do what did you do with that do you want to say anything um i would just say that like through that we're still somehow still trying to farm <laughs> and we're still hosting woofers which maybe this can lead into the next thing so at this point we've already hosted three woofers between two different stays mm -hmm. um yeah, we had two college girls from Vermont that got an internship. I was an intern advisor, which is kind of wild. Mm -hmm. uh, and then another guy. And then starting, the first guy showed up on Easter morning mm -hmm. of that year. 
Um, and then another woofer came and stayed with him. But so we had extra help. Um, but that, that allowed us to just kind of keep on with everything we were doing. So running the gardens, uh, mowing, because I make, uh, we've always made, since we started mowing in 2020, we make more money mowing because then we're part of like the real estate racket mm -hmm. than you do actually farming. Um, so we just kept that up. And then the other thing you worked at one of the trendy farms in Lawrence. Yeah. So I worked at a farm. I did like a whole program through a college here. Um, where I was like learning, taking classes on the side and then also working at a farm full time mm -hmm. as well, just to kind of gain like a full year in depth knowledge of market gardening in the area. Um, and I don't know what else I should say about that, but, uh, well, we have to talk about the train story, Okay. <laughs> but, but yeah, so she did that and we'll come back to that. And we kept volunteering at the Catholic worker down the street. Mm -hmm. Um, and then yeah, two two big stories we wanted to share. Uh, one I experienced was I, I got a connection to uh, a nice restaurant in downtown Kansas city. And uh, the chef wanted me to grow like uh, basically custom lettuce for him. And again, like this year was like the flowering of things that already weren't working, but like they, they kept going. Mm -hmm. And so the chef and, and at a restaurant where plates start at like 15 would be the bare minimum, but probably like 15 to 30, you know, if you want a steak, it's probably more. So like a nice, uh, a nice restaurant. And he wants me to grow this custom lettuce for him. And it turned into, we, we, we were, we were going back and forth on the price and what it basically came down to as we're sitting in this building with like a huge vaulted ceiling and if they're paying rent for it, it's thousands of dollars a month. Um, though we were arguing about five to $10 a week, which for me was just one more example of how like I wanted to help create a better world. And the best thing I'm doing is like uh, not making money so that fancy places can greenwash and have just a garnish of better stuff and like it's a good restaurant like i still go there periodically mm -hmm. um but to me this is just another it's another image where yeah. i feel like what we're doing is we're piling up images of mostly failure and we keep going and maybe the moral of the story is some like thomas the tank engine stuff but like <laughs> imagine you have this outfit that is clearly successful and you're arguing with me about five to ten dollars a week and mind you, they want to say that they're serving their customers locally grown produce. Sure. Or at least, yeah, there's a section on their menu uh, at the bottom with like their local suppliers. So that's like a part of the reason why some people would go there. I know that that would attract me mm -hmm. to a restaurant if I really thought that they were using locally grown food. Mm -hmm. Right. So did they, what did they do with your lettuce? Did you sell any? Oh, well, they cut it with not local lettuce, which I think is also which, worth Which is a putting. super common uh, thing. Most places that say local, they're mixing it with Cisco or whatever lettuce, yeah. uh, but still calling it local. Yeah. Okay. Which, That's something for people to keep in mind, isn't it? <laughs> and and where, I, where I do want to be charitable is at least this restaurant and a few others actually buy local lettuce. So these are the minority that are actually kind of supporting. Uh-huh. And that's what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. And and I don't think people, and, and this is an example of, I did not understand how bleak it would be mm -hmm. that a chef who wants you to be delivering five to 10 pounds worth of lettuce, which, you know, if you're selling it, we're not selling it to him at $10 a pound. So think about that. So that's, unless we can chain it up with other deliveries, five to 10 pounds that let's say it's $10 a pound and it's not means that we're hopping in a car we're driving 10 to 15 minutes one way we're unloading it we're we're going back and to sell 50 to 100 dollars worth of lettuce right yeah that's that's tough to get by on and that's a good customer it sounds like right and that's not even the real number i've <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, and my, you're risking your life, by the way, every time you get out onto the highways in Kansas City. So you're literally like risking your life just to deliver this lettuce. 
Uh huh. And so the people that are buying their fifteen dollar plus entrees uh, can have a dash of of local lettuce. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And <laughs> and I mean similar stories too. I I. And then you're doing it in part because you're like, well, hopefully this is leading somewhere. Hopefully we're getting leverage. But I have other. I could just go on about parking in like the Indian Hills country club and they bought five pounds worth of lettuce or radishes or something. And literally I had to walk like 10 minutes through like multiple kitchens so they could be like, well, thanks for your $40 of produce. Wow. And then you have to walk out past all the Rolls Royces and the BMWs. And, you know, like if you were, so with contractors, um, you know, they're in such high demand that if you've got a small job, they just aren't going to do it, you know, like, because Mm -hmm. they've got so much other work, people have to use a local contractor. There's physically no other choice, right? Right. (laughs) Somebody's got to build that right there. And so that's their situation, you know, but you, you have the option to just say, you know, kind of screw it. I, I did the 40 bucks isn't worth it because you're thinking, well, how else can I build a market? How can I build like, a, a clientele if I don't do this. Right. And part of the difference is being in the agricultural market versus those contractors, you know, however hard they work at the end of the day, the money's flowing in because real estate is one of the few solid investments that we just keep inflating. Mm-hmm. And then they can kind of have a, a, a quasi monopoly as a group. They have a monopoly on the labor. So basically they get cuts off the real estate market right? or the racket, I would argue. Now, again, this cuts again, Star, we want to believe in the dignity of work. You know, this is what the Front Front Porch Republic and the new polity people, they want to believe, oh, if we just have, if we work hard and we have skills and we do good quality work, then we'll make wages. And they will, but they'll do it under late capitalist conditions. Uh, Tell your train story. Yeah, so this uh, farm I worked at in 2021 um, was just outside of like a college town in Kansas. Um, and we were right outside of like a train track, basically. And this was a train that delivered like coal multiple times a day. It delivered, um, I don't know, anything and everything. And an Amtrak maybe once a week, but trains going by at least like two to three times a day. Um, and this is also happening as I'm like figuring more and more about like, you know, what it takes to have like a quote unquote successful market farm basically and a CSA farm. And again, you're learning all these things that we've already said of like, you have to be like insane basically to like hold it together and do this. And you also, you're working your ass off and, um, you also usually have some kind of outside income subsidizing the farm or your lifestyle. So I'm like seeing all this again in a different lens of like, you know, my boss trying to hold it together. Um, and from one of those winners, I was from one of a went like uh, one of like the best farms or everything or a farm, the first like certified organic farm in Lawrence and stuff like that. So like a farm that's well known and everything, uh-huh. um, but still like learning like, one, how like we're farming itself is still like not super sustainable. We're still tilling. We're still, um, I don't know, doing other things, turn over as much produce as we can to make as much money as we can selling, you know, beets and turnips. Um, anyways, though, there was one day though that, um, you know, I have all this in my mind and everything. And there is on the, train tracks just syrups and or train cars full of corn syrup going by just like for miles of it and it was just like you know we're standing on this tiny little uh not tiny but like relatively small size market farm and then just industrial ag is just like again going right by us just overpowering us traveling by train rather us we're delivering in our little van dropping off you know, boxes of produce to people are getting up at 4 a.m. to try to sell enough money, you know, worth the vegetables. And meanwhile, just train cars and train cars and train cars with corn syrup. Oh, are yeah, that's a that's an image. That's a very memorable image. And all that corn syrup is giving people diabetes, high blood pressure, you yeah. know, 
literally causing Americans' life expectancy to drop. Mm-hmm. It's but it's winning, you know, it's yeah. totally winning. And then we're back at that long term versus short term interest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's propping up vast corn farms, you know, that are heavily subsidized by the US government. Why mm-hmm. the heck would we do that? It doesn't make any sense, like from a long term perspective at all, but mm-hmm. in any given year, that's what the farm bill is going to support, right? Sure. And and the interest it serves is our monarch, which is capital. And since we have no collective way to rationally seek the common good, then all we can have are different rackets that leverage their markets and their political positions to expand. And that's why, I mean, to me, that, that's kind of abstract and that's a bigger level thing, but that is why you have like Pepsi and Coca-Cola doing what they do. Yeah. And matched up with people have desires that they've scientifically navigated to fulfill. That they've created, you know, they've some created extent. those desires and they've changed our palates. You know, like if you sure. get off, not to go on a diatribe, but like if you get off sugar, substantial sugar for even a few months, suddenly stuff tastes great. <laughs> okay. So obviously it has, it has an effect even on your own ability to taste things. And pretty soon you're used to that and it's preferable, but um, right. it's not gr- we're created with. Yeah. And, and I'll grant that. And my, and I'll just add to that. Nobody in my life has ever told me that soda and fast food were good for you. True. Yeah. And and I was given a Kansas public education. Uh-huh. So that's pretty <laughs> incredible. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, sorry. Nobody told now, me. Of course, that. they also said the vending machines were right outside, but uh yeah. But I guess my point is uh there are these structural rackets, and then there's also everybody's individual stupidity. Yes, so. we can't totally let people off the hook. They make those decisions. But you're right. I mean, when you said the vending machine is right around the corner, I mean, if you look at what people say versus what actually they do, mm-hmm. like when the school puts the vending machine or, you know, K-State has a contract with one or the other of those soda companies, right? Um, and it's everywhere, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, the message is this is do it you know but anyway we digress yeah yeah but i mean that's a good transition the last image i wanted to give people was a conversation um there's a guy uh basically a hippie uh pretty most people would say he started out working at at the nonprofit that uh we're at and um I, I just look back on it because externally, a lot of people would be like, well, how different are you really from him? Even though there would be some differences, like he's way more new agey and, and you know, I've gone down this Catholic route. But like, if you saw us in 2019, you would think you're working at the same place. Um, you have so much in common. You want, you want the future to look so similar. Um, and then cut to to it was i think it was in the fall of 21 nick from the we interviewed about the fracking in season one um and lives next door to me um nick had complained he's like i i really love daikon radishes um and i know all these farmers but nobody's growing daikons and uh this other guy he has a decent amount of land and he didn't go more the market gardening route. He's he's tried to get like a side career. Um, and so we were we were sitting around a fire because we started hosting these little events that we called Foodie Fridays, where they were just kind of like it was like a potluck, except we all kind of like cook it together. Mm-hmm. And usually it was like me or Emily or Nick actually bankrolling whatever we were doing. Um, and it, it was that one of these events around the fire where the the guy had said yeah i don't know what i'm gonna grow next year and i'm like well uh you should maybe think about growing daikons because he's grown a bunch of daikons in the past he says he likes them um they hold well in the field and i was like because nick wants daikons 
and we make kimchi and stuff and we could throw those daikons into into the kimchi and then we can continue to grow our stuff and you can just grow some daikons which you already grow and he just looks at me and goes i think i'm gonna grow a ton of squash and in my head i'm thinking like i hope your house is just overrun by squash bugs (laughs) because that is the most absurd for people that don't know like squash plants oh yeah produce a decent amount of fruit but they will attract a ton of bugs normally. Oh yeah. And, and usually those bugs will overrun the plant. So like if you could have kept this plant healthy, it could produce for months. Mm-hmm. But usually in my experience, you're lucky to get like two months out of them. Mm-hmm. And so the idea, saying. the idea that this one guy would grow a lot of them, like he's courting literally hundreds, maybe thousands of individual squash fruits. Uh-huh. And to me, it's another, it's another piled up image of we can't even organize with him, you know? And again, if he was like, no, I don't, I really want to kill it with squash or something, that would be one thing, but I'm pretty sure he didn't kill the game with squash or do any other substantial growing. I bet he so, has just an infestation of squash bugs that would prevent any further crops. <laughs> maybe I bet you he didn't even do it. Oh, you don't even know if he did it. I, I, I doubt he did, but what, you know, some people uh, say I'm a jealous hater fascist. So to sort of like um, make sure the 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 loop is closed. Um, he's coming over. He's enjoying the dinner, free food, free, free food. food. You know, hanging out with you guys, and so, and then you know, you suggest maybe he should grow these radishes that. Yeah. Some after folks, after he asks, or or at least muses about what yeah, he might next right day. that that some of you like and could use but he's used your stuff and this is where you know like this is why i talk about reciprocity and friendship if you don't have it you don't have a friend right Mm -hmm. that's where you find out like he could have said no you know spencer like i can't do a whole field of daikons but because nick likes them let's do like 10 by 10 you know plot of daikons or whatever if he had any like i don't know appropriate valuing of the relationships right But Mm -hmm. no, like it didn't, that didn't even occur to him. So that's how you know that not really friend is kind of where I go. Like that. I agree. Okay. I I agree. And yet the tragedy is if we're not friends with him and he would claim that I'm, that he's my friend, at least if we're not friends with him, who can we be friends with? Well, like each other and Nick, (laughs) I think Nick (laughs) And, uh, (laughs) you know, there's a few other people, I mean, but you, but, but people that you can count on are rare. They are. So, um, Mm -hmm. when you find them, you gotta, you gotta do what it takes to keep them. Um, but that's, you know, I would put him in the, uh, acquaintance category. I mean, you can have like a ton of people like that in your life and they can be kind of fun to hang around. You just, you just have to know that you can't count on them. So whatever you do is, is kind of a free will gift. You know what I mean? Yeah, sure, sure. And all of that, I, I I can agree with all that. If we could go back to me in 2019, the argument would be, therefore, you cannot have, at, at even a small scale, an anarchistic commune that can can bring in people like him because at the end of the day, they're fake friends. Yeah, I mean, that does seem like the conclusion is that that the reality of that is, in, at least under our current circumstances, impossible. And I, I have a theory as to why, which I'll be very short about, but we don't share religion. We don't share culture. Fundamentally, we don't share values. And if you don't, if you don't have that, those kind of core things, like to unify people, you're asking people from very different, you know, world views and life experiences to find common ground in a sort of liberal way in which they see their rational self-interest. But we've already determined that people don't actually do that. Right. In the absence of culture, you get this like, you know, flitting around from one desire to the next. And that's why you can't pin people down to cooperate. We really yep. need something like that, which is why I think we've all kind of instinctually gravitated to religion or back to religion um, because you realize right. there really is no substitute. Right. Cause at least to be clear, this guy does share like 
95% of our values. Mm -hmm. That he's to me a case example of how you would like to think, okay, we don't agree about religion, even though I would argue his worldview is totally conditioned by post-Christianity, but whatever, let's set that aside. Let's pretend we don't agree about religion Mm -hmm. instead of he's mostly in denial about the metaphysical sources of his beliefs. Um, We do believe, we do want local food systems and we do want anarchoid community, you know, communities. Mm -hmm. And even he, uh, you know, you ask for something that would benefit all of us when he says he doesn't have a plan and he's like, and then here's the other. So the the same guy, after our seedling sale didn't work, I sold him uh, the rest of the seedlings at like 25% their actual costs. So 75% markup, mark down. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just transferred over the debt because he never, he worked off a little bit of it. But so, so while he's telling me this, he owes me like several hundred dollars. And I bring all this up because I don't really, I'm so in the hole, what is a few hundred dollars? Like mm-hmm. this is a dime on the ground. But when I tell other people this story, they'll be kind of like, They'll be objecting like, well, why can't he grow what he wants on his land? You know, or, you know, who are you to say what he should or shouldn't grow? And they're missing the fact that I'm not so much complaining about. I'm not like some petty tyrant who just wants to tell him what to do. It's more, is he doing it with other people? Um, is is he actually living up with, to his values? Everybody's like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. And then I say, well, he owed me $300. And they're like, no, that's unacceptable. It. Yeah, like, wait a minute. <laughs> What a douchebag. They don't see the 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 connection. Yeah. 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 I, and then, yeah. And again, I don't know what to make of that. Cause even, even when you talk to one of our woofers who was pretty, you know, out there anarchist trying to live without money, that was his reaction. Mm-hmm. Is I, I talked all this, I had all these complaints. Oh, I don't know. Then I'm like, he owes me three hundred dollars. Unacceptable. Oh, well, and it's, then it comes it's because back. money yeah. makes it real for them. Money makes it real. Now, money is a Even real for thing. alleged anarchists, like hard, yeah. let's live without money anarchists. Right. Because they've been so conditioned that they can't, they, th- that's still instinctually their position. If it's about money, now you, you know, you've got a serious agreement. If it's just like you asking a guy who kind of owes you, you know, uh, for favors you've done to him, let's say, mm-hmm. a favor is not a serious thing. Nebulous. No money has been exchanged. So you ask him for a favor and it's not a big deal to say, ah, no, I don't really want to do that. But if you're like, give me back my $200, you you know, people get indignant if you didn't get it back. That's true. Yeah. But meanwhile, and then connect that to the the autism discussion. We were to some extent talking about money that like, if he could have grown several hundred pounds of daikons and if we could... If we could have anteed up with the bok choy and if we could have processed those, there is money on the table. And and to me, this is part of like the tragedy of sort of like the libertarian capitalism, whatever, is that part of what I'm complaining about is these people around me aren't thinking entrepreneurially at all. And, And not just in terms of like, how do we make money? How do we how do we establish businesses where we can exploit workers? But they're not even like, how do I leverage my resources to make a better world? At least they're not doing it with other people. Uh huh. Yeah. So they haven't even learned the best the best lessons of capitalism. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or 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 to like harken back to our Coutron discussion, they're like sub bourgeois subjects. Right. Yeah. They think they're with it, but actually they're their image of a stupid peasant in the Middle Ages. Yeah. Sort of hanging out, waiting for things to happen. Which mm. is what Ortega y Cassette says most people are at, like in the modern world. They're hanging out, waiting for something to happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Jesus will come back in his own time. Peasants, yeah. Yep. Right. But, well, but there was but, but peasants without a religion to justify the peasantry. But anyway. Right. Um, in the beginning of 2022, we had some meetings to partner more substantially with the Catholic worker down the street. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which it is, I think after 21, with also the sales with also failed relationships with the, our friends around us and everything. Part of these meetings and us talking, it was like, okay, in 2022, 
let's like get more serious about maybe partnering with um, other people, specifically this Catholic worker. Yeah. Um, and this was Lori's bright idea because yeah. what's the argument? Blame. You have me to, well, the, my argument was let's look around and see what's already out there nearby um, based upon your values. These are kind of Christian anarchist types that have, you know, just decided they're going to do something positive for the world. And <clears throat> I knew that they were, that they were like feeding people and you've got food and they have kind of a small farm operation and you've got tools and know-how and stuff. And I thought, well, you know, the, the, how could they not know each other? And so I asked Spencer if, if I could kind of like help him reach out. Cause he, he tried himself like once or twice and he couldn't raise anybody. So I reached out um, to the person um, persons running um, that uh, Catholic worker and made a connection. Um, so yes, it was my idea for better or worse. And it was a, an eminently reasonable idea and less risky, you said, than trying to do some sort of light, like avant-garde lifestyle anarchism stuff. That's what I was thinking. Cause I was like, why reinvent the wheel when somebody else out there is already kind of doing it? Maybe, maybe there's a way that, that, you know, we can piggyback on that and, and, um, yeah, not reinvent the wheel. That's always better. Uh, so, I mean, I just thought we should explore that. Mm -hmm. Right. And we started volunteering there in the fall of 20 and we stayed involved. Like we volunteered usually mm -hmm. once a week. We were involved in like, they host a lot of beehives there and they have an orchard and mm -hmm. we were in a prayer group and in book clubs there. So like we were like, above average volunteers i guess for the groups that they get yeah. um, and and for people that like are really following us we i encountered that native book that was the first book club we did that horrid native book that i did that whole series yeah. on Cap uh, Not, kathleen curtis right yeah mm -hmm. uh, caitlin caitlin, caitlin. I, th mm -hmm. I think the sequel's out but mm -hmm. uh that's how deep the that's how deep we tried. I suffered through that book to be uh -huh. to try and be part of that community because I'm and like, then, getting, and then this, this and counts then, for something, right? We're getting somewhere, right? Just wanted to mention that Spencer did a whole series on the political philosophy channel about this book just to purge himself. Uh, but go ahead. Um. Anyway, so so part of where. Um part of going into 2022 part of where we were at was okay mort is clearly like uh barely surviving at best um and we are getting along pretty well with the catholic worker mm -hmm. so maybe what we do is we kind of fold up more turn this land into like a little eco development or something you know become petty landlords it's in my blood and then we 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 moved to the Catholic worker, and then we you know that's where we live, and most of our energy is going to to. Um, and so we had some meetings with the leadership. Emily became an intern there, um, and yeah, and and Nick moved in next door. Um. And one of the things that really it was it was a sign of where things were going. I guess there there were multiple things, but we were at like a long Easter vigil and my truck got stolen and all my tools. And that was a huge hassle. And again, you would like to believe like, you know, if you're doing the right things, people aren't going to like steal your shit. Uh, but they did. Uh, we and, and then another we, we went to your mom's funeral. Yeah. And I I had started, we were finally clearing brush because we've had brush piling up for years. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd started a buy, I've been like, how do I uh, kind of ecologically responsibly handle all this brush? And the answer I arrived at was like, well, we'll turn it into biochar, which is kind of charcoal that you charge with uh, microbes and nutrition. And then you put them out in the field. Mm -hmm. And we do lots of things like we filter the aquaponics system with it um, at that nonprofit. Um, and I, I'd, I'd started a batch, 
Um, I think yeah. real quick too, we should back up specifically for the farm here. Our friend moving in did mean like, again, hopefully that like, we'll have more eyes around, we'll have more people around, we can like do more, we can share more. We've got the woofers on the other side, they can do more, share more, cook things. Responsibility can hopefully like flourish out and everything um, and so on, Mm -hmm. I think is important to. Or at least people can at least kind of take care of themselves Mm -hmm. because we've created a context where there's like a foundation for that. Mm-hmm. So you've got woofers on one side, two people living in one house, mm-hmm. and um, Nick living on the other side. Nick on the house other. He would later buy. Yeah. Um, right. Well, he bought it he by bought, that point. Yeah. Oh, he bought it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, and mind you, still also, I think this is important before we get into the biochar specifically. We're still on a stage, though, where neither Spencer and I have left at the same time. It's always also only like, someone still has to like anchor what we're doing with the nonprofit and everything, because like functionally we can't No, we couldn't figure out like, could people take care of it while like, let's say the both of us are gone. So we're still like very much anchors of this operation. Okay. Like on, on the few times we did for leave for the weekend, it was like stressful knowing like, will the lettuce get delivered on Monday? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And again, the lettuce that we're barely makes any money, period. We're worrying about five to 10 pounds worth of lettuce being delivered to a place mm-hmm. because we so can't trust the people around us. Um, and so going to my mom's funeral was not the first time you'd been out of out. Of no, that was the first together. that the both of us were. Oh, the, OK. Like the first time. Yeah. OK. At the same time, at least that we're both out of town. Um, All right. So you're both out of town and you're relying on the folks back. Yeah. And I'd started this. This was a controversial decision, but I had made a big batch of biochar, which in retrospect, I will own. Emily pointed out recently that I never owned that I made a mistake in starting this pile. And my defense of it is not that I was in denial about it was a mistake. My defense of it was if I in the social context where that argument was being leveraged, the point of it was to make me at a minimum, equally responsible for what happened, where instead of, uh, and I would argue, really, I was being made more responsible. Mm -hmm. Um, Right, because what I did, and this is another, most of these stories, if you're paying attention, are petty. And um, I think I've done a lot of soul searching. I don't think I'm petty in finding them deeply problematic because it is the very pettiness of them that shows how absurd the situation is. Um, so I had made, huh? I was just going to say it's it's petty on the one hand, but it's also like the very su- stuff of like life itself. And it's, it's getting things done, you know, so none of that stuff is interesting, you know, in and of itself. It's a lot of it is kind of tedious. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet without those things, nothing gets done. So they're right. they're important. And, and the issue of can you work together to get things done is is kind of crucial. So yes and no, I guess. Um, right. So. And so so we're coming up on your mom's funeral. I had a big pile of brush in a big pit. Should I have let it? Probably not. Should I have let the fire get as big as I let it get? Definitely not. Was it a bad time to be doing this at all? At the very least, probably. And uh, Emily would argue, definitely. Um, Was it a good time for me to be doing this? No. Did it really all hinge on I was being, I was tired of all the brush and we had the pile. And part of it is I don't relish having to organize all these people because they're hard to organize. And I didn't want to have to form a quorum to deal with this brush pile when I could just do it now. Was it a mistake? Yeah. Was it a disastrous in its effect? No. But it uh, did have repercussions. It did have repercussions. I did singe some trees. Um, and, and But really, the reason we're talking about this is because um, yeah, after you make biochar, you have to, usually you put it out with water. You can try and smother it with like covering it with soil and stuff. But 
um, because I'd made such a big batch, it was hard to put out. And so like for the next, I think it was day or half day before we left, Mm -hmm. um, I kept putting water on it and it was still like smoking. And Mm -hmm. so I went to at least two of the three people around here and was like, Hey, um, we're leaving. They already knew we were leaving, but we're leaving. I, I did the biochar. Um, can you keep an eye on it Mm -hmm. and make sure it, it stays out? And then we left for, I want to say like a day and a half, two days. And I come back or we get back and I immediately smell smoke. And I'm like, there's no way that's the biochar. You know, I'm just feeling all right about things. And then I like keep smelling it. And I look over and there is a little like smoke coming up. So I go and look and like, indeed, the the biochar did not fully get put out. And, and a, a fair amount of it had turned to ash. Now, at the level of like the actual organization or like the material of things, I didn't really care about, you know, if you were to put a dollar on it, we probably lost like 30 to $60 worth of biochar, like not that big of a deal. But for me, what was so like rending about it was like, literally there were two to three people, two of which regularly walk their dogs around the neighborhood and literally could have just walked up there. Whom you had asked to. Right. Put it out. And who I'm bending over backwards to like support in various ways. Now I'm yeah. not handing them money, which is maybe the mistake. Maybe, you know, if we want to return to like capitalist realism, maybe this is too far afield, but maybe it just would have been made more sense. And maybe that pit would have got put out if I was a more traditional landlord. Maybe if you if you were paying them like an hourly wage and one of their duties was to put out the biochar, it would have gotten put out. Yeah. It's true. I'm not saying that you should have, but right. I bet so, that would have made the right. difference. And I was just so livid because it's like we asked for one little thing. Mm-hmm. We had everything else covered. Yeah. Everything else we like figured out other people to or like did a lot of prep work in advance. And literally, to be clear, we're asking people to go out once every six to 12 hours, see if there's some smoke coming out and hose it down. Right. And they are living right across the street. So it's literally 30 seconds from their front door. Unless you're asking people to have object permanence and to, to think about think about us, think about the biochar, think about what's going on. Right. And well, maybe that's you, too much to ask. You've asked them for a favor. It's kind of like if I asked a friend to like come and make sure my cat didn't starve while I was away for a week and they oh. didn't come and I got back and my cat was dead, you know, or certainly in a case in like distress. Sure. And I'd be like, was it too much? You know, you live just 10 minutes away to come <laughs> once, you know, right. <laughs> and, you know, so yeah, it's disappointing because it's like you've asked for a favor in a system where, you know, you you're you're trading favors basically without money. You know, like they're living under the roof of a house that that you own. They've sort of, as I understand it, as woofers, like promised to do a certain amount of work in exchange. But you've also developed relationships with them, a friendship, right? And so you would. Um, you would ask for a favor and kind of expect it to be done. So I think, I mean, I remember at the time that I felt like, man, Spencer is like really, really upset about this, this one thing. But I think for you, what happens is the one thing symbolizes a much larger truth about relationships. And that's what's upsetting. Which is that if they can't be faithful in little, how are they going to be faithful in much? Right. Like how, what can you count on is what it boils down to. Mm -hmm. Right. And the general answer is you can just count on not being able to count, which is fine, but it's like, well, then what, am I just going to be a liberal subject? Am I just going to go get a job? Am I just going to worry about me and my own little garden? Is that the parameters of what's possible? Mm -hmm. Right. Right. That's what you're trying to get past. Right. And and an objection people might be saying is, well, to some extent, it's because you've gathered around yourself like, you know, the lumpen proletariat or hood rats, call them what you want. Um, Why don't you get competent, sane, thoughtful, 
you know, group minded people. And my answer to that is I've made that argument. (laughs) Right. One, where are they? And then two, where they are is not doing uh, farming in the ghetto. They're competently or at least semi competently running bigger institutions. Um, Yeah. So anyway, for a little bit, I was on a war path because it was like we literally we have to we being me and Emily in this instance have to maintain everything. Mm -hmm. And we cannot count on anybody is what it increasingly felt like. And and I would argue, like, the, the way the theme's developing is, like, the year before, it was like, we can't depend or, you know, we can't trust as much, like, our family or our best friends or people in our community that say they're down. This year, it was like, even the people that had, to, to a greater or lesser degree, signed on for Mort, we couldn't rely on. Mm -hmm. um so that's the significance of the biochar um and then um but maybe in a way it was good because we're gonna just barely skate by this because we're we're still trying to be on friendly terms uh but uh july was an adir in our relationship with the catholic worker down the street um and we have largely retreated from that um for because that could be a, like a multi-hour podcast in its own way. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it was wild and and more wild than anything we're going to talk about in this podcast, mm-hmm. what we encountered and very disheartening. Yeah. What Do happened. you want to like take two minutes or something to sort of like summarize the essence of the problem, at least for people? I mean, I'm leery. Okay. I'm leery at all. I will tell you. The essence of it is I thought we had a better relationship with the founders and Mm -hmm. the anchors, quote unquote, of that community. Mm -hmm. And I thought when if we ever ran into an issue, especially I would argue petty issues, that we could sit down and talk them out. And even if we agree to disagree, we would at least have a conversation. Mm-hmm. And what we learned, I would argue, like, we're, we're skating by this in part because it is the total low point of the four years here. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially since we were we were thinking of maybe we jump ship to this Catholic worker. Mm-hmm. Um, because we're all very inspired by the Catholic. I mean, now you've started the JP2 Catholic worker farm there. Instead, the Morin Academy is... Uh, inspired by Peter Morin's vision, right? Uh, the co- one of the co-founders of the Catholic Worker Movement, um, and so you know it it makes total sense to cooperate with them. And yes, I I also was just kind of like dumbfounded as to how why that couldn't happen, and it seemed like it did boil down to again human relations. I don't beat myself up for suggesting it because um, it did, it did, and does make a lot of sense, and and um, and I know that uh, we all learned more about the Catholic worker movement through um, the interaction, mm-hmm. you know, um, and that that was good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we support that. Yeah, and the hospitality that they do there is like unusually good for what you think of um i don't know other catholic worker houses or just like serving the homeless population in general i mean it is unique i would argue um yeah yeah so right and i'll add what and we're leaving them unstated but whatever our breakdown in communication and community with uh, some of the people there involves. I'm I'm willing to grant that they way more than most people have made sacrifices in their lives to make that Catholic worker happen. And I don't know everything they've gone through and surely the large amount of trauma they've been subjected to. What we encountered there was somewhat similar to the biochar thing, but even more wild. And it's like, how do we, how can we build any kind of community or any kind of like alternative society, even at like a micro scale, even among people that claim to be anti-colonial and anti-racist and, and for working people, what we encountered was very disheartening and, and has contributed now, now 
I have a theory that the way a large amount of the Catholic worker movement functions, which isn't to say it was meant to function this way, but in practice what it does, especially when the Catholicism gets hollowed out and you become more like radical liberals, is that it its main social function is to take naive and or idealistic people that want to, you know, be part of the change they want to see in the world and ram them up against situations and people uh, as of like an encounter group is, would be the psychological term that they function like encounter groups to take people that might live a different way and be like, this is why you can't though. Uh. This is why it's literally impossible. Mm-hmm. And that's a cynical read, but like, and we're powering through it, but that's the takeaway. Mm-hmm or one of them. Yeah. Yeah. You can totally understand why people having even a fraction of those experiences um, would say, well, this obviously um, just can't work and I need to like back to the birds. Oh yeah. So I'm, I'm going to do what I need to do and just like throw up their hands and, and, and go, which, which arguably might've been what, what happened with the the guy that you talked about in the last episode, the the last one to leave, so to speak, of the original. I think so. Crew. Yeah, yeah. But I think more in that early phase functioned for the exact same purpose. That I mm-hmm. guess I'll just go be middle class and live a life of quiet desperation. Yeah, and it's it's like um, sad to think that it's an either or um, situation. Um, and all of these experiences have made me wonder if they're if we can even take baby steps. Right. Because forget about, you know, what direction does the commun the, the fifth communist international take? Forget about what do we do with our business. It's like we can't even like be honest with each other. Right. That's or why, it- you know, like last night when I sort of summarized what I after the Laudato C, the second part. I summarized some like recommendations and almost all of them were so mundane that it would be easy for people to think, ah, like she's full of, you know, crap or whatever, but it was just stuff like forming reciprocal relationships, like, you know, actually um, going out and doing something and, and like literally forming a relationship with somebody that you can actually trust and then testing it and practicing it because Mm -hmm. that's where we're at is like, that's almost a radical step, you know? It's like, and it is the first step towards any other level of cooperation. If you can't do that one kind of baby step of forming really solid, predictable, lasting relationships, well, you can't do any of the rest of it. Yep. And so that happened was very disheartening. That that whole month is just like a black hole mm-hmm. in my mind. Like, Yeah. But paralleling that, though, that's around as that low is happening, we're also like, transitioning in a lot of ways where like that's whenever the Moran Academy was really first formed after like you know years of thinking and you guys working on you know what this could look like um and so that officially started um and then also Spencer converted to Catholicism officially if you want to in in August in August which was a long time coming yeah but, yeah. Do you want us to uh, sort of like summarize like what what tipped you into going ahead and converting? I mean, I'd always, I guess, ever since like you kind of pushed me in that direction during college, I'd been mostly going like when I would go to church, I would go to Catholic masses because I just think liturgically like I, I don't understand why at this late date anybody identifies like as a Methodist versus like a Presbyterian versus it's always been strange to me that people fall into these. I guess it's because I've had a Catholic sensibility and most of these outfits with the exceptions of like, I guess the Orthodox um, or like very broad, like post evangelical Pentecostals with those with those exceptions all these groups seem to me like various kinds of heretics and heretics in the sense of like etymologically hieresis meant like choosing, like taking a side. So like um, at at the risk of being overly simplistic, um, you know, Calvinists are heretics because they're choosing like divine election predestination over human agency. And I would imagine, I don't know much about this, but Baptists are heretics in the opposite way, that everybody's free to choose and that's the ground of, of people's choices. 
so I would just say because of that comportment and because liturgically, even, even the Novus Ordo is, I think, better than almost all Protestant like worship services. For me, it was just like, am I going to settle down and choose a Christian group um, and, and commit to them or not? And, and it made a lot, I mean, I had to do a lot of studying because like, it's like, do you actually want to commit to like more or less mainstream Catholicism? Cause you could go into some traditionalist direction. You could go Orthodox, you know, the Orthodox have their own trads, the like genuine Orthodox. I had to do a lot of soul searching about that, but eventually I just made the choice to, to go with Catholicism and see where it led. Um, okay. And, and I, and, and I want to clarify that I didn't push you towards Catholicism. Okay. Well, nudge. I just happened to be a Catholic. So if you were asking about Christianity, this was my reference. You told me if I didn't convert, I would get an F. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) I'm I'm toast. No, like, no, it was was my reference point. And I remember telling him, you know, why I converted. I, I, I want to create some context here. So I don't look like I'm out there like, you must convert or die, you know, like sure. a Catholic regime of oppression. Come well, in. <laughs> well, maybe here's, here's the save. I'm so hard headed. You have to push me to, to even like register the suggestion. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, my, but, my position has long been, it makes very little sense except for all the other things that are even make less sense. Like, sure. Course, Yes. All right. Yeah, which DC Schindler said on a recent Larry Chap interview. Yeah, compared to what? Yeah, exactly. All right, uh, but anyway. And so that that I started going to RCIA in like February or something, and then so throughout all this, I'm I'm attending those. Um, and one of the inadvertent effects of whatever pull was pulling me towards a more Protestant or a more Protestant, like Christian anarcho perspective, uh, with, with our relationship with that other Catholic worker, like mostly falling apart is like, well, I've got like nothing but the Catholics religiously around me happening. Mm -hmm. Not to say I couldn't go to other churches or whatever, but, um, and, and the more I thought about the more I like, before February, I had never actually entered into like Catholic discussions. Like I I'd read the Catholic books and things, but never to the point where it's like the neo Thomas disagree with the race resource Mott people disagree with like the concilium people. I never entered into any of these debates before. Um, and so, uh, once I found, uh, like resource Mont and then Larry Chap was an encouraging person to find because I was still committed to like Catholic workerhood. And then he's being like an, an, an Orthodox Catholic. Um, and then, yeah, I went down this rabbit hole where you find Communio and DC Schindler and his argument that like, it's in Catholicism that, that we have preserved like the real potential for like a universal society and actual reason that if we lose this, we're on like a Nietzschean slippery slope towards nihilism. And and that made a lot of sense to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like Schindler as well. Um, thanks for introducing me to Schindler and Larry mm-hmm. Chap. He's great. I love talking to him. Mm-hmm. New books out if people want to find it on mm-hmm. Ignatius. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, and yeah, I guess I would say, and this is a more, this is a harder thing to talk about, but I, there came to be a kind of, I guess, satisfaction, um, in, in going to mass that I, that I had maybe had in germ, but like, didn't really start to happen till last year that there is, I guess, I guess I would call it a pleasure of going to mass, mm-hmm. which is hard for a lot of religious people to understand or non-religious people or probably it's religious people too. It's the Eucharist. There's just a genuine difference there that, you know, Catholics believe this the, the real deal that you're encountering Christ in every mass. Who wouldn't want to go? Versus the real absence or mm-hmm. whatever. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And Emily is going to be baptized in eight days. But so that right around the time that I'm being confirmed, uh, the the two woofers, their relationship is breaking up. And I think and so, yeah, right around the time that I'm converting or, or getting confirmed, 
um, the, the two woofers that lived next door, uh, the male started being abusive to the female, which took us a while to track because they always bickered. And, but eventually we like stepped in and got him to go. And then she, one day, Emily car eyed me, she's called me and she's like crying and kind of hysterical. Uh, and like, I thought like something had happened to Emily or something, but she'd come in on the other woofer who had OD'd on, we're still not fully clear what, um, and again, it's just another piled up image. Um, she was okay. Like we called the paramedics and she's doing better, but it's another image of you know, we wanted to do community. We wanted to build some sort of like local food system. And it's literally, we can't stop the the woofers that claim they love each other and care about each other to either abuse, not abuse the other one or not abuse themselves. And also they would say at that time, they also like loved us and cared about like our friendship with them and our relationship is also another thing that they would claim and probably still do. Oh, I think they, and I think they genuinely did and do. And even I, who just kind of show up like once a month, if, you know, if that, like we, I especially knew the male and I felt like he had a certain attachment to me and I, I did to him too, but, you know, it's frustrating that, you know, like those relationships weren't profound enough or valuable enough to cause um, them not to kind of fall back into those destructive ways. And so on the one hand, it was all very wild. And on the other hand, for me, it was after all the other like chaos, especially in July, it was like, well, why wouldn't this happen? You know, (laughs) like there was almost this like, for me it it made me able to function because it's like well they couldn't take care of the biochar so like why wouldn't they be doing this this makes as much sense as everything else and and part of it was like i think tied in with that was the schindlerian catholic argument about like well they're disconnected from any kind of like objective reality and so they are just being consumed by their contradictory desires and why wouldn't they be behave like this mm-hmm. which i think is like the problem we ran into with you say with like any of these like i don't know even with some of my friends that wanted to get involved or like people we know in general like why do they keep like flighting around to do different things or to feel pleasure in other areas of life um i don't know their sense of reality and sense of self is is weary i guess so weary or weak or weak yeah yeah it's almost like we all you know we all need some version of aa um but we only we won't we only make alcoholics uh go to it but you know that that idea of a higher power and self-worth is what people are missing right yeah and again part of it you know if these woofers were now off living their best life and we're just jealous hater fascists back here in Kansas city. I would feel a lot less bad about it because at least like, well, they're, you know, they're butterflies. They flew away, but it's more like uh, going with, with this imagery, it's more like they were caterpillars and they kind of went into a cocoon and then they mostly came out caterpillars again. And so then what was it all for? Like, was it just the vibes the hanging out well and these two were i mean yes they were woofers but but they'd hung around a long time and so it kind of looked like it kind of looked like they might you know stay and genuinely be a part of a community long term so that made it even more kind of inexplicable frustrating it was very disheartening but it also made as much sense as anything else that had happened that year Yeah, I don't know. I feel like to some extent that was like a capstone on the whole Mort project, you know, or because part of it, too, was like it's like, you know, dying to ourselves to become new people, hopefully. And it's like, well, what happens if like one of your woofers just almost dies on the kitchen floor? That is one way the story can go. And and almost did. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm I'm glad that didn't happen. But um, so that brought to an end their presence there. Mm-hmm. and so and you still have 
Nick next door. Good. Well, yeah, and and there, we ha- we had to navigate for several months. Like you know, first we have to we get her in the hospital, and we're in the waiting room, and, mm-hmm. and then of course she's in outpatient stuff, and she wants us to bring her all you know some of her stuff, and so we're getting calls about that, and then they're leaving stuff even after everybody's better, and they're mostly moved out. They're still leaving a bunch of stuff, mm-hmm. which is amazing how much people that are, are poor can accumulate. Yeah. So I mean, it was. This again, it was literally like months cleaning up their stuff. Now, not not like full time jobs, but yeah, um, that was its own little job, just cleaning up the rubble. So that house is empty at the moment, except for your tools. I'm putting a new roof on it. <laughs> um, right. Eventually, mm-hmm. going to co own it if everything goes well. Should mm-hmm. I say that yet? Yeah. Okay. Um, but in the meantime, you don't have anybody there. Have you thought about having more woofers or? Uh, maybe someday, but we need a break. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or at least a year and maybe more. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Cause here's the thing. It's not, again, it's, you would, at least you would like to think, well, at least if you're, if you're like a capitalist, you're trying to get more out of people than you put in. But I, I found always with work, the woofers that like there's a lot of energy you have to put in, which is OK, because that's part of what they're supposed to be getting is an education and the experience. Mm-hmm. But it's when you're doing all this stuff and on top of it, you're doing a certain amount of educating people. Um, mm-hmm. And as I've gotten more tired and as it's become increasingly clear that most people don't want to have some sort of Socratic dialogue and arrive at truth. And more so they just want to monologue their truth at you. Uh, I become a lot less patient with uh, humoring these types of quote unquote discussions. But so uh, one of the things that held throughout all of this has been, you know, our relationship, the Catholicism, our commitment to Catholic worker values, Mm -hmm. Our friendship with you. Yeah. The more yeah, academy. The more, yeah. Yeah. And, and so maybe the value of all this has been a kind of like purifying fire to like elucidate the value of these things. Well, it's, it's not as expensive an education as a four-year degree at a state university. <laughs> I don't <laughs> <laughs> it was expensive i'll tell you that <laughs> expensive expensive in psychological uh well-being for sure um but you know like you can't get that kind of education any other way um and you're right like at the end here some really good things have come out of it um including the jp2 catholic worker farm the re sort of renaming i mean i think there were there were multiple things going on like we go to sometimes we go to this mega parish named our lady of good counsel and they're like the the diocesan shrine for divine mercy Mm -hmm. which is the like jesus i trust in you image that Mm -hmm. at least in kansas are all on the highways yep associated with saint uh faustina kowalska Mm -hmm. Yeah, and secondarily with John Paul II, exactly because they were both from Poland around the same time, and and he's the one who canonized uh, Saint Faustina, um, the first canonization in the new millennium. So there, there was a significance of like we're you know becoming increasingly more Catholic, if not Catholic already for Spencer. Um, we're also like intertwining a lot of Catholic social teaching with what we're doing with the Catholic worker. Um, and then again, our faith too, with like this divine mercy stuff, it all just kind of like felt like it was meshing together. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah. right. And just, and just briefly to expand on one of her points, like as, as I've grown, p- part of what all these experiences with people lead you to do is also grow disillusioned with a kind of leftist organizing, because it's like, how are you going to get, you know, we can't even get people to take care of themselves. 
how are you going to get people to at a national or international level to solidaristically organize along class lines to form institutions that don't exist that are going to challenge actually existing political power to like create a new political economy like um and I, I still, you know, obviously I, I still flirt with Marxian ideas about like the inherent contradictions of capitalism and, and the need to establish some sort of revolutionary subject. I, I think those are important. Mm-hmm. But part of the coming down has been like, yeah, well, maybe Catholic social teaching is a species of utopian socialism, but maybe it's less utopian than so-called scientific socialism. Um, yeah. And 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 where i still am kind of attached to the marxian stuff is like also let's be honest this is a species of utopian socialism like i'm so in, like there's a type of catholic who just wants to like critique things and they're these like hyper liberal types where like they'll tell you what's wrong with every world view and then say oh that's why we just need to follow the church and social teaching but then it's like but do you do any of that in your own life other than vote republican because it's pro life like they don't mm-hmm. Sure. And so, so there is where, where I, I do like the Marxian like critique of political economy is it does brace that Catholic social teaching in a way that if you don't have that brace, then like liberalism just over determines people's whole world views. Yeah, 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 I agree that um, Mar- Marxist analysis of economics is extremely useful, but you said it very well. Like, um, we're not going to organize to form a, as some sort of like Marxist revolution. That is a utopian dream. Like that's, that's what, because with all the experiences that you had, surely, you know, people got the message. We can't even cooperate about the smallest things right now. We're too like degraded. Right. So the idea of like anything other than joining some sort of um, sort of progressive movement, writing a check to the Sierra Club or, you know, something like that, you know, that lobbies Congress, you can do that. But um, but, you know, like it seems more plausible, although still very utopian, um, that the Catholic Church or the Christian Church more generally could, you know, lead a sort of push towards a different way of life you know, like a reevaluation of values, you know, towards a meaningful um, existence, you know, which is extremely utopian. But at least those are institutions that are in place that still speak to people that some people still take seriously, have resources, have in the case of the Catholic Church, you know, millennia of like teachings available for people to access. That seems like a whole lot more firepower than pure straight up Marxism has. So at this point in time, it seems like more realistic. Not, not to say real real, but if I were a betting person, uh, I'd re- I'd sooner bet on that having some sort of impact. Right. Mm-hmm. Right, and and JP two, you know, definitely made his contributions to to Catholic social teaching CST. And so as we've kind of reconceptualized these things along more Catholic lines and Catholic worker lines, it's like, okay, so the Moran Academy is doing the roundtable discussion aspect. The other Catholic worker is doing the House of Hospitality stuff. And then we can focus on the agronomy and trying to be worker scholars and figure out better CST. Well, you know, I bought into this idea. I I love the Moran Academy I think the people that are involved really are starting to appreciate the way that we do basically roundtable discussions like modernized. Um, And um, I'm excited about hopefully inspiring some of them to form groups um, in their own areas so that they can think together and maybe do some things together. I'd like to talk to people about that idea at some point. And so there, there's a sense in which this is all like directly flowing out of the more collective stuff. Um, and and maybe maybe it is like the butterfly and more it was the caterpillar. And maybe this is like all for the good. It sure has felt like in that cocoon being like digested up and rearranged. And Yeah, totally. I mean, like mm-hmm. a kind of death, right? 
Um, and we have to hope that this kind of this rebirth actually comes to fruition. It's too early to say, right? It has some, you know, promise. It seems like more put together and more focused. Um, we have a very solid foundation in Catholic social teaching. Um, and and we should see where it leads. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, I have hope that it is going to be that butterfly that comes out of this, in which case it, it was worth it. And and definitely there is a through thread that none of this would have happened if you hadn't have started out a long time ago holding a book club in Manhattan, Kansas, and then moving out into the world and, and doing the stuff that you did and eventually trying to form more. Uh, it's the, the number of like kind of horrible like experiences here is is just kind of astounding. It's like either bad luck or somebody is trying to like pound lessons into people's heads or something. I don't know, but like it's mm -hmm. I, it's it's extraordinary. I think it's because you know you tried so hard to you pressed relationships to that point where you were like, I want to count on you. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do that, you're not going to have nearly as many of those experiences. So I think that's why it, it's, it is more than bad luck. It's like, literally you tried to get people to like respond in kind in a very serious way. And therefore then you found out in a very serious way, how few people will do that. Yeah, and there's probably a case where, to a greater or lesser extent, this discussion has been biased towards the more negative things because, well, especially in my case, I'm a melancholic temperament and I tend to to, to marinate and brood over like the more negative aspects of things. Um, so it's not like it's been one unmitigated disaster. But I would say we've encountered more like negative resistance than actual positive success, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. And then, and if people are wondering, so then the other missing ingredient is I put my, uh, I come from a certain amount of familial wealth. The only reason this has been able to happen is because I just keep infusing uh, an inheritance into this thing. Mm -hmm. Because if it weren't for that, we wouldn't have even been able to survive enough to get beat up like this. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, most most people who had those kind of ambitions wouldn't have ever been able to make it that far to have that many experiences because they would have run out of resources long, mm -hmm. long time ago. Yeah. So which is why it's valuable for people to hear these experiences as negative as they have been in a lot of cases, because it's good information for anybody who is like wanting to start out and do something so that they don't just sort of blithely fall into one of the many traps, mm -hmm. you know, that are out there for people who really have the best of intentions. And we really do need to, we, you know, folks say all the time, Oh, we want to have, especially the younger generations go out and, fix all the problems of the world, go on and do it with no, like, no good information about, you know, how difficult that is or what they're up against and with very little support for it, I might add, next right. to none, right? No, no real support. Um, right. They just expect you to fix all the problems that they created uh, somehow. Yep. Right. And part of the irony is look at that, look at this mostly failure. And to the extent it's not, it's because we push through, probably by the grace of God. That's with all of our privilege. <laughs> You're right. Like, Hopefully some of the Patreon people are listening. You know, they often, you know, want to kind of know what they can do. And if you're thinking about what you can do, you have to absorb this kind of information this is the lay of the land. It doesn't mean that you can't do anything, but the only way you could possibly do anything positive is 
is either to like run this gauntlet yourself or maybe learn from people who've already run some of it. And not not, not to say, and don't make the same mistakes. That's not what I'm saying, because those aren't necessarily mistakes, but to recognize um, the pitfalls and the dangers as they're coming so that you can perhaps like deal with them um, as effectively as you can. Yeah, because it is real out there. It's easy to imagine these things, but just ask a friend for help and not, and not like I need this extraordinary help, but ask for like consistent help, ask for a commitment. And very quickly you find that most people are like, no, we got, we got to face facts. I don't have the time and energy for this. I, I have other priorities. And mm -hmm. a lot of which are very reasonable and, and justifiable is the tragedy of the situation. Mm -hmm. So commitment is what it's all about. If you don't have that, you don't have real relationships and you don't have real love. Mm -hmm. Love is not a feeling. Love is commitment. It's what it is. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's too rare. Hopefully we will be, you know, inspiring people to, seek that even if it's just one or two or three people it's more valuable than a whole boatload of fair weather friends <laughs> <laughs>